I will. Um, Wolf? Here. Coons? Here. Pleska? Here. Brown? Here. And Wolfhoff is uh, on one, correct? Here. Yes. And student members here. And our student <laughs> member, Hillary Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, celebration achievement. Davis? Yeah, I invited um, Mel and Megan to share a little bit about uh, math that um, we want to celebrate. All right. Mine. You sure can. Yes. Uh, maybe. This is not a tech savvy group here. <laughs> I'm out of hold. I'll click for you. I'll show you in a quick. And let me slideshow. All right. Yeah. Do it and I'll watch your hand. There we go. All right. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Megan Myers. I teach at Grade at the Media School. And about previously, for the last five years, I've taught. Um, so I came to share a little bit about the math work we've done at FIS last year and this year, um, starting this year with the perspectives. And um, as some of you may know, we hit it heavy last year, like really working hard on uh, implementing new materials. And a few things that are really important with the perspectives that we learned was um, rather than our students memorizing algorithms and working on like rote skills, we wanted to focus on real world problem solving, and that's exactly what um, our focus has been. So, I wanted to share some uh, a problem that we came across last week. And um, as a teacher, you may know that sometimes when your principal walks in, you're like, "Oh my gosh, we're passing out birthdays!" Just like walking out. But <laughs> Melissa walked in at the exact right moment about a week ago. It was pretty awesome. So, these donuts represent a numberless word problem that my students created on their own. So I'm not going to click once. Yeah. So just one. go back. Sorry. No, I, I got <laughs> it now. I got it now. You're a no That's right. I would absolutely love it if you guys would just take a step back and be a student for me for the next few minutes. So, um, this problem was created by my students, and the goal is instead of choosing just two numbers in a word problem and doing some operation with them, um, we wanted them to think more about what to do with the problem. So, this is exactly created by my students, fifth graders. There were some donuts out of the three. What questions do you guys have, or some things you're wondering about this problem? What type of donuts? What type of donuts? Exactly. That's what some of said too. Some customers walked into the bakery and bought donuts. Okay, we got a little bit more information, right? Like okay. customers, but we probably still have some more. Can we go to the next one? There were 15 customers in the bakery. Do you have any more questions? Things you're wondering? Is there enough donuts? Are there enough donuts? Yeah. Really good question. Are they all mine? No, it's really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the last one. And this is the big question that we unveiled at the end. There were 15 customers in the bakery. They each bought six donuts. How many donuts did the bakery sell at all? So if you could just for a moment, either in your head or on the if you have paper and pencil, could you just think about how you would solve this problem? The first thing that comes to your mind. Well, I've kind of seen some of the stuff that. Yeah. <laughs> so I normally would, in my head, you know, start doing the, but I've seen how you break it up. And so it would be six and then groups of 10. And then you got six groups of five and then bring them together. That's your number. So when you said I would do it in my head, were you thinking of like the standard algorithm? Yeah. 
right. which is hard. I mean, I see some of the yeah. stuff that comes from yeah, the kids, and I'm like, I don't do it that way. But so yeah. instead of the standard algorithm, you went back and thought about like your base 10 mm -hmm. and breaking it up. What was your question? In my head, I say, okay, 15 times 2 is 30, so that's easy. So mm -hmm. then that's 30, 30, 30, which is going to be six. That's how it goes in my head. I just did 15 times six. <laughs> carried, fast. huh? You no, in my head, I carried it, you oh, know, no, and no, no, brought no, it no, down. No. So, I push my students like that sometimes. Yeah. I couldn't do double digits. Okay. No. <laughs> uh -uh. Don't no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally. I think we both. Um, <laughs> I think Mel and I looked at each other like, what did we just witness? That was incredible. So, would you go to the next slide, please? Yep. This was the problem. Okay, okay. Next one. I think we can all agree the problem that we're trying to solve is 15 times 6. Let me click one more time. This is um, student A said, I would double in half this problem to make it a more friendly problem 30 times 3 equals 90. Which wow. <laughs> yeah, right? A fifth grade, know. fifth grade student. <laughs> Incredible. So in fourth grade, um, we worked a lot on our multiplication strategies, and this is one that we did highlight double and half, know that you can manipulate numbers and um, use them to make more friendly problems for yourself. So I was, let's just say, I was very impressed and excited. Um, this is brought up. Student B, the next kid to raise their hand said, when a car I see 15, I think what clock? And I know that there are four 15s in one hour of 60 minutes. So um, that's 60, that's 15 times four is 60, and then two more 15 is 30 more minutes. So that's one. I know. <laughs> so um, I have a little bit of a unique perspective because I've taught fourth and now fifth. And seeing this transfer of students as they've grown, obviously, like knowing what they learned last year and seeing how they apply it this year already in the first few weeks is pretty incredible. Um, so, just sharing that the work we're doing um, is really powerful and that it's being retained um, even in the first few weeks when we don't always see um, the best work because they're just getting back in the groove of things. But this was a really neat thing. Some that it's stuck and they only know strategies was just absolutely yeah. mind blowing. Yeah, it, it was amazing. Um, and we, it just so happened the other two returning fourth grade teachers from last year happened to be looking for me in the building and so they realized I was in Megan's room right after yeah. we were like literally raising the roof for the kids. Yeah. And they came in and we were like, we have to tell you guys this. And so all the kids got to celebrate that too. So, so how yeah. many, like in, in, within math, like how many? It's probably different for each one, right? So you present a bunch of different ones like this as far as how they take it up. Yeah. So there's a couple different things that kind of happen, but a lot of times we try to let it come up with things that we like from it. So we uh new perspectives they have math congresses every couple times a week. So um a math congress is when we might take a piece of student work and highlight it for the group to see, talk about the strategies they use, chart them try to use them then in our everyday work. But we also do um, just kind of some warm up practices with different numbers, kind of like this. You might see a problem like 15 times six, and we just talk about it. What did you do? What did you do? How can we learn from each other? And it's not always necessarily like the most efficient strategy to share, but we have to share a variety of strategies. So kids can really learn from each other and grow in that way um, too. And I think a lot of us too, in the work we've done have learned how to use some of the vocabulary of the strategies that kids are using so that like double and half whenever we notice when we're doing something like that we highlight and say oh i noticed it you just did the double and half strategy or um the clock strategy that my student needed it like i might the next actually actually came up a couple days ago we're doing a number string or some problem um, another 15 problem and I said, oh, I remember a few days ago when this student said that they used a clock to think about 15s and he raised his hand again. I said, that's exactly what I was going to do. So um, bring that up. And that's really the heart of all the math work that we've been working on is 
how many different strategies we have, kids might be able to enter that problem at a different level mm -hmm. um, because we have what we call landscapes that we're working through in math. And so one of them might enter at a lower spot on the landscape. And so as teachers, we've been working to figure out, okay, how do I take this kid from this strategy that's not as efficient to the next most efficient strategy and kind of stair step them up to where we want them to be. And I think too, just like by the work we're doing, we're honoring all strategies and saying that, you know what, wherever you came in at is perfectly fine, but I think we could probably, you know, through watching each other, learn how to improve our work. Um, because last year, I will say, I probably have several students that will look at that problem and say, 15 plus 15 plus 15 plus 15, six times. And then throughout our time together, they looked at their classmates and thought, oh, like I think I could probably try something that Bobby's trying or whatever. So. Yeah. Well, I'm privy to listening to lectures driving home from Ed Harris, yeah. <laughs> who um, is actually coming here uh, in October. Uh, so these are uh, this is exciting stuff to actually hear what I hear the most actually in the classroom and in the future. Um, and she's uh, also a workshop model actually. So I was going to say, she references Cockins' work a lot, and so they really, yeah, they really mesh. They really mesh. I happened to tweet this out the day this happened, and Ken yeah. Harris happened. Just she, I felt like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty awesome. So, again, like when your principal walks in a view, it's actually a moment. It was pretty exciting, but um, this, this does happen more than just at one time. This is not one time we feel our students are doing this. So we wanted to celelebrate it yeah. 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 yeah thanks Megan all right okay um, anything else on <laughs> Anything else for celebration? No. Uh, focus on learning. Yep. Um, I asked Mel to talk a little bit about the um, work with literacy. Yeah. I don't have a fancy presentation. I just have a sticky note. Yep. So, <laughs> um, we have really focused a lot this year on getting back to Kimberly helping our teachers take it to the next level. We've done a lot of work with Lucy Cochran's materials and the writing units. And we spent some time last winter really thinking about what's happening in the classroom. Teachers and coaches and um, Jody Idol from AEA came and helped us just do some writing sweeps through the classrooms just for us to get the data to say, what do our teachers need next? And so through that data collection and analysis, the admin team came around the table with Frank and they um, and we really started thinking about what does PD this year look like for literacy, particularly in the area of writing. And out of that came, we really want to make sure conferring is better understood and able to be a, um, something we support teachers with because the conferring end is really how we get kids to the next level in writing in the same way Megan was just sharing about math. So through talking with Fran and looking at that data as an admin coach team, we really identified wanting to compliment kids on their writing. So we look at the writing progressions that we have from Lucy, and we're figuring out where are kids on this progression? What things are they doing well? Maybe it's transitions, maybe it's you know, just the organization of their paper, maybe it's the word choice that they're using, something on there that we can compliment kids on and tell them why that's important that they're doing that. And then think about that from the perspective of where is the next place I can work as a teaching point with those students. So really working with that with Fran so that we can do what we call thin slicing with our students' writing. We take that writing and we look at it on our rubric and as a team think about, okay, if this is what a kid wrote, is this what you know we're seeing on the on the rubric? Um, so that we can really think about how am I going to be able to support them academically <coughs> in instruction. And that's the work that we're really focusing on right now is getting the thin slicing solid K-5, because that's something we want to make sure that we're calibrating across the K-5 world, and even up to eighth grade, I would agree that this, we're also losing pockets up that way. 
Um, and then also thinking about are we conferencing every kid? Right now, teachers are have a goal by the end of September to compliment every student on at least one time between now and the end of September. So we've been working to keep that in the forefront for them and then also providing the PD for them to know like what are the three parts of a good compliment for a student, naming the student, naming the strategy, and telling why it's important. That's where our focus has been right now. Um, we have Fran coming on the 29th to take that a little bit further. And right now it's been coaching and administrators in the building, focusing on the thin slicing and keeping the temporary piece in for four five for teachers. So that was what our CLT was about today with teachers. So we're moving right along and it's really been a data driven decision. Mm. Fran's gonna be working with us throughout the whole year. We've kind of mapped out uh, the work with our teachers. One of the reasons why conferring was picked was it really does take, it's the next step in that, but conferring can stretch across the whole day. It's conferring is like coaching. And so it's feedback and it's, it's those one-to-one -one conversations or small group conversations um, with, with students. Um, and we're, we're focused on writing, but then can, they can take what they learn and use that, those, that conferring in math, in reading, in, in, and throughout the day. And um, that's another reason why we picked that specific um, instructional practice focus uh, this year, so. Well, it's important to put our coach hat on. It is going on the And then I, you're going to do our board, our admin report. Yep, I asked Josh to do our admin report. Well, I see your hand out there just to keep me in my box. Uh, but first, I really want to talk about just give a little quick update on our graduate work and really kind of highlight some of the a couple of things that we're doing. Um, you know, last year we spent uh, time, and it, was, it seems like a slow process, but we're really being intentional and trying to be authentic about this portion of our graduate work. It really comes down to what do we truly believe about students and um, as educators and about learning. Um, as well as the skills that we want our students to come away with by the time they graduate. Um, Zach and I have been working um, in tandem on this and pulling in uh, feedback from PLC facilitators and secondary staff. And um, I believe he's gonna pull uh, his parent group back together to gather some more feedback around this as we're wrestling with, with these ideas. I think we're pretty set for the most part on the beliefs. And again, this was, information that was gathered from staff. Um, and that is learning is a process. Social emotional learning is foundational. All students learn, uh, learn differently and collaboration is key. And right now we're really wrestling with how we operationalize that and what does that really truly mean from, mean from a district perspective? And then from a building perspective, how do they operationalize that and, and make that happen? The same is with the skills. Perseverance, goal setting, critical thinking, uh, collaboration, effective communication, self awareness, balance, empathy, positive relationships, inclusive, uh, and respectful. And these came out of working with our staff and staff input. High school students were involved in providing input around these in terms of um, thinking about interpersonal skills, interpersonal skills. Um, Category. But to really dig down and, and say, okay, if we really believe that these are the skills our students need to be even more successful uh, beyond high school, whether that's in a college setting or in a work setting. But again, how do we make these authentic? How do we operationalize these? 
Um, and we're really trying to spend some time dig, really digging into these. We're going to probably bring, bring these back also on October 17th during our professional development day, just to kind of resurface, resurface these and have a conversation around each of these ideas. Um, we want it to be authentic, we want it to be usable. We don't want to have just a pretty poster uh, that we see around sometimes. Yeah, that's what we're all about. But if our actions don't align to our beliefs, um, and what we want to see, then what's the point of that? So um, this honestly um, relates really well to the next uh, conversation uh, around student-centered learning. This uh, this week uh, during our administrative meeting, we spent about 90 minutes with Dr. Stillwell again. He came and facilitated um, some of our work around student-centered learning. Um, and again, really digging into that definition as we try to come up with some recommendations that we want to bring to the board at some point to wrestle with as well around our mission and vision statements um, and really try to force not force but really try to place an emphasis on that mission and vision statement and being really student-centered and focused um, during the presentation that megan presented um, the beginning here that is an example of student-centered right there it's not a worksheet, it's not a workbook, it's not, hey, you do problems one, two, three, four, five. It really is students being involved um, in problem solving collaboratively. They're generating some of the ideas like the word problem. They're solving the problem. Um, they're bringing in their interests and their understanding, and they're all at different levels. And we scaffold and support every student where they are. It really truly is that developmental approach to learning that we want to get out of students. Um, so during that, that time, we really spent some time defining and trying to redefine um, student-centered learning together to, to create some clarity for ourselves. Um, and really think about student-centered learning is redefining the relationship between the teacher and the student, emphasizing student reflection and feedback uh, goal, and it really is uh, a reciprocal process between the teacher and the student where both are giving each other feedback um, and setting goals, um, providing voice and choice, that student agency and ownership, and, and et cetera. And there's a lot of other things that components to that. And then uh, another piece to this kind of a product that's gonna come out of this work uh, would be this backwards design protocol, uh, where first uh, what we look at or, or is really defining and clarifying what does it look like for students and what do they require in order to make student-centered learning become a reality. So we, we're really trying to stick to um, who, we, who are we trying to impact the most? What's the outcome that we want? We want students, that we want to be student-centered. So what do they need in order for it to be student-centered? And that really comes down to voice choice, that feedback and reflection, goal setting, asynchronous learning opportunities, where they can sometimes define the place and the pace at the, which they want to learn or able to learn developmentally. Then on down the line, then what, do te what does it look like for teachers and whether they need to make this happen? What do principals, administrators need to make this happen? What does it require? What is the central office that we need to provide? And then all the way up to the board and coming to you and saying, this is what we need to make this thing happen um, for our students. Um, but first and foremost, it really is just that clarity around what students need. So we're going to continue to work with uh, Dr. Stillwell. Uh, we're going to utilize the support. It's just it's great to have an outside perspective and facilitation um, because sometimes it's just hard for an internal team to see above the weeds and outside the weeds of, of who we are. Um, he's pointed out some things to us um, that maybe we need to be thinking about differently or providing just hey, have you thought about this? And there are times where no, we have to talk about that. So just really trying to help support us, um, keep moving along this path. It's, uh, some of my comments and my reflections, this is really messy work. There's not a um, beautifully written formula or algorithm that at the end it kicks out this outcome that now you're student-centered, that's not how it works. It's gonna take time um, looking at research, and in that research, and identifying some metrics that we want to measure to determine our success and benefits. Mm -hmm. We believe this work, you know, it may impact 
um, our strategic plan. And so as we're working with Dr. Stalewell too, we're also kind of planted the seed that there, there may be to a point where um, he facilitates admin board together. We may have a work session uh, with him, maybe, you know, after Christmas, I know we've, we've had that with ISB uh, might be a good time to, to bring Dr. Stilwell in and just continue this conversation uh, with the board involved. Um, since it, it will have impact on the strategic plan. So this is the second or third time that Derek has met with him. Hey, Josh. Uh, well, this would be the third time that Dave's met, yeah. but second time. Right? For the whole yeah. admin team. So, yeah. We've met with, Dave's been met with uh, him prior to this and really had, I think, it's been about an hour with him yeah. really wrestling with some of them. Yeah. Not just, you know, not just the facilitation, but just the vision. So, where do we want that? Yeah, and that, that'll be good. Uh, I think that is where it will be good to have the whole board involved in that you know I, the the mission is the how the vision is the why well the why is uh we i mean the why we want every student to graduate prepared for post-secondary success how do we get there how, how do we make that happen and that's that's the mission statement we've got to create and and i know we've got a a, a pretty good i mean that's that's a portion of our mission statement there, but how do we make sure our mission is student-centered, student-focused to get us to the why, which is we want all of our students, regardless of their path, and we've talked about this, whether they go to a four-year school, whether they uh, uh, hook up with a, a journeyman, um, apprenticeship, uh, trade school, right into the workforce, how do we best prepare them? So I guess the question I've got as we, as we get through this is, as we look to our service, students have graduated and those have been out a couple of years. We want to, you know, we've got this set of this can set of questions that we get answers to. And we've kept it the same because it allows us to look back uh, and, and give credit prior to the state. But one of the things that always pops up is how useful is it in actually telling us how successful we are? Like that's a question the board has asked. Just like we get these answers, but what does it actually tell us other than you know, we can look at what's changed, but doesn't relate to our what we're trying to accomplish. Does it tell us how well we're doing in preparing students who are going into the trades? Does it tell us how well we're doing the students who are looking at things other than you know the 40, 40 year college career path that was what was what everyone was supposed to do when the survey was set up. You know that was the that was society's belief at that time is that everyone should needs a four year degree to be successful. And so we've got questions that, that, that try to get at that but how are we going to measure our success and what metrics do we have both immediately when kids are graduating? You know, who is going to graduate this year? So, who is going to graduate this year? Um, wait, not going to redshirt her? No, we're not. Going to, oh. I, think there, I think there are rules against that. We can check with Casey. I think there are rules against that. I don't think she get the COVID year to come back for another year of uh, high school sport, oh. uh, softball. Um, but the question is, you know, when we get to the end of the year, how do we know, you know immediately how our students are doing in terms of their preparation for wherever they need to go? And also, you know, a couple years down the road, the kids are the same. Sometimes you don't know that they're ready. You know, students think they're ready, and then you know, we've heard back from students subsequently where they, they thought that they were not as ready in certain areas as they thought they were. Ready. A number of years ago, we heard questions about math, and then we made some changes there where students thought they were ready, but then. You know, uh, they, 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 we had some of them struggling when we when they got off to college in math. And so, how many things been interesting to hear of those panelists? Have you, have you attended those panelists and conversations mm -hmm. with the senior, the graduates who come back? Yeah. It's interesting to hear their stories and some of how they felt they were prepared or not prepared. Or, I think the question was always SBG how did SBG prepare you or Stanford's great in preparing you for you know, college? Um, but a lot of those were. Kids who went to college, and we haven't, I don't know that we brought a lot of kids back who just went straight to the workforce or straight to the military. Or, hey, how did, how did your experience here at Solon prepare you for, for those experiences in the world? Well, I think I just think about as we talk about, you know, student agency and providing the voice of choice, and, you know, how are we preparing students to make those choices? You know, I think, you know, I was in Europe, so that, uh, and it wasn't, you know, Tests that are going on. There's this, as you look at education systems, there are, there are these divergent paths. And, and, and when 
are they are they are students get to make a choice? Are they are they headed to the both tech direction or are they heading, heading to college? But there's obviously the risk associated with that. You know, if a student makes a, a choice too early, they get pigeonholed into that direction, and they, it, it's hard to it's hard to pivot. But the flip side is, you know, um, we're doing a we're doing a walking tour. We're talking to and they've got like this whole process for Straight at 16, they, you know, they go this vote tech route, there's this transition where they are working and going to school, and this is gradual transition that increases over time. They're moving in that vote tech in the school is integrally involved. So parents and edu the educators are getting feedback from the, from the, from the vote tech side of things in terms of what they're doing, the way the first step was heading down the culinary route. And so it was like, you know, it started off this way, you know, it started off as a Boy and you know, working in the, and then was moving into the kitchen, and you know, he was going to be back and went from a couple hours a week to now you know, 17 years, like spending 20 hours a week. Yeah. And so, it's, I, I just you know, I just wonder, it, it raises those questions about you know, how are we, how is our system set up? And I think that's what our hope is with the apprenticeship. Uh, we attended a meeting in case he's kind of heading some of this up to you, he attended the same meeting and gathered some information that's around the health but the hope that, I mean, we're, we're looking at how do we recruit some of these students at 11th and 12th grade, but initially, but honestly, it should be starting in 9th and 10th grade. Um, and as we look at the apprenticeship in the healthcare sector, the hope and goal is as they get this, and there's some great structures already in place that we will we'll go beyond that. What does it look like in, a, in a, you know, the remote tech field yeah. or you know, what are some other opportunities we have for kids to get those apprenticeship hours, get paid apprenticeship hours, and then to get a mentor with that you know, and keep pushing them and ultimately get a certificate that can be that's transferable across the country and they can get a job anywhere they want. So I think that's one of the that's one of the big things that we're doing right now is to get involved with that apprenticeship program to help to prepare us or get you know, get us launched into the next next level of work that we can. I, I think that's I think that's good. I, I, I think the question that does come back and filter down to the lower ones, which is when you start preparing students for being able to make these choices, you know, some people set the opportunities and what directions they can go. So I've you know. had some initial conversations. It, you know, really should have happened in seventh grade, should have happened in sixth grade. I mean, there are things that happen, but it's just like informal or you know, career day. This is my but truly exploring. What am I really truly interested in that I, you know, I may want to explore when I get to high school and have those opportunities? Yeah. So, good question. You know, we know work with a bunch of undergraduate students extend and learn. Mm -hmm. Are students involved in the work of STEM? Yeah, very much so in the portrait of the graduate. Yeah. But yeah. Then, I mean, it's easy to say we want students to study learning with a bunch of adults who say what students study mm -hmm. learning looks like. You know, <laughs> in, in that life is more some choice, you know. Um, I laugh because we, in my home, we do this because the teacher said, right. right? You know what I mean? And, and, and so I, I would be interested to see how this all goes right. for our students. I think one of the pieces we watched the videos in the in in classroom in Australia, but ultimately came down to the teacher in the classroom um, was being vulnerable enough and transparent enough with the students to gather feedback from the students ongoing, not just about the assignments and how they're doing on their assignments, but how is class going? How do you feel instruction is happening? Is there things that, that are frustrating you that maybe I could change in that classroom? It, that's a huge shift, but that that ultimately, and that's where I say that's a reciprocal relationship, feedback. The teachers providing students feedback, but the students are providing ongoing feedback to the teacher and not just about my achievement. So I'll, I'll be the person who's going to raise the, the big administrative challenge to that. Mm -hmm. We have different students. Right. And Hillary may have one preference in, in how things go. Sure. And you get that feedback, and you're mm -hmm. constantly just and you're going to be just constantly bouncing around trying to well, Hillary liked it the way it was. Now we got feedback that they like it this way. Now it moves this way. Now Hillary's providing feedback that's you know, how much of it, how do you keep it from being a constantly changing 
approach that winds up meeting no one's needs because you're trying to meet everyone's needs. So that is the big question. It really truly is structuring your classroom where students have the opportunity to have a choice in how they learn at that moment in time. That's where that synchronous piece comes in. There may be, and there's opportunities where students may be engaged in a, a task with a small group of students. They may be in a task that's by themselves. It may be in a task with uh, the teacher and a small group providing either um, feedback, conferring, uh, direct instruction, or even some um, remediation or intervention that, that needs to happen. Those are some of the things we're working on at the elementary level in terms of math workshop. Um, and that's essentially what that is. We have reading workshop, which um, essentially is those opportunities for kids to be in centers or stations where they're practicing or learning uh, either together or individually at different times. And that's essentially the goal of also blended learning. I guess I'll intercept the question that Dan's asking for us. Does this lead to how does this factor into the issues where our students are trying to advance to? We've got a student who knows the material and we've had this conversation. They're going to spend a, they're going to spend a semester in a course where they know 95% of the material, but they are required to take the class to graduate and they already they already know of it. Mm -hmm. And so where does this lead? How does this does this address that? Oh yeah, 100 <laughs> percent I'm confident. We just have to put the structure in place. It's that we've said this before, low ceiling, low floor, high ceiling. We want to make that ceiling as high as we can. We also have to be able to take the handcuffs off, off of off of us to be able to make that happen. But there's got to be, but we but there has to also has to be some learning and there has to be some structure in place. It's not as simple as personalized learning, everybody gets to do whatever they want. We don't want that. We want to make it, we, we want high expectations for our students, but we also want to give them the opportunities to, if they want to push higher and farther, we want to push that envelope as much as we can. So, so I'm going to do two quick things. I'm going to check with Cassie and see if she's got any questions online, and then we'll check with Hillary <coughs> and see if she's got any questions. <coughs> I don't know if Cassie's muted or... We're in a couple of chat rooms. That's what I was going to say. I saw oh. the chat number change. That's what I was going Can you guys hear me if I talk? Well, Cassie, do we have an opportunity to bring some students back Sessions that have graduated. Yes. So we do. We use the same process that we use with SIAC generally. Um, so I think we could definitely do that. And you know, so I think that's that is useful. So I think something we can look at that maybe would be useful to um, gain some of that perspective as we go down this path. Now I'm going to open up to Hillary because we've all been talking and then sometimes we don't uh, pick up that. Uh, so, any, any thoughts on this portrait of graduate that you want to ping at, uh, at Josh? And, you know, how realistic does this seem to you as, as somebody who's, who's been soon to be a graduate? I have two things. Yep. So, I know I get that SCS class, that's like, a, like the job kind of in the high demand right now. But I know that's one thing that like some people have struggled with because. Going into college, you need to like know these simple things and you know, like how to pick your meal. Because I know a lot of people in high school don't know how to cook and do all that stuff. And then um, I didn't know if that was like perfect or not. Uh, no, not, not specific. Okay. That's not specific. Okay. And then the other thing is um, with math, like the high school math, mm -hmm. since like COVID, we've gone like all in one. And it's like most of the teachers don't really keep it to you. So I know last year like, a lot of people struggled with that because we were like sitting there trying to keep it ourselves. And it was just like it was really hard. Like a lot of people like didn't have to ask. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I think that based on my conversation with what I think there was an assumption that it has to be all online. If it's a blended learning environment, it should be all technology, which is not true. It's, it's a blended environment where there's instruction happening. Blending with technology. I know that in my conversations with with that team, they're looking at some different research this year of what that what that classroom culture climate and the organization looks like to be able to support um, support students other than being online and trying to watch a video online. Yeah. That's that's not 
not as not, I would classify that as not necessarily highly effective instruction, but um, So there's a lecture that she watches before, and then they do all the homework while they're in the classroom and have some work. And so, I mean, it's different. College has more open time. Sure. Now. But, you know, just what, what is there that thing for how um, students just learning on their own? Probably not the most time. So, um, research would support just playing right. home. So, that would be interesting to know what happens with that. So. Thank you, Josh. I think the uh, note for Davis and Chris is that uh, we will want a work session in the ground that we'll get the students back so we can work and have a conversation. I think so I'll, I'll put that on this uh, to make sure that it's scheduled and something that we're going to have set. Um, and I think just before we move on, it's the same thing we want with the feedback and reflection. Mm -hmm. we, if we're going to ask for it out of our teachers, we better be able to ask for it for ourselves, right? And, and where we're where we're doing well, and where we're going to the future. And so I think it's a great idea. Okay, uh, board three. <coughs> I don't think there's any. I don't think there are any planned things for this year. We, we had the work session earlier where we talked about the rest of the buildings uh, in the process. So. No, yeah. What I what I put on there was just. Um, the work session. We yeah. discussed the, the work session. And that is, as you guys all know, we don't have negotiations this year. I think we we're hoping to get back into some of our uh, yep. discussions. So, negotiations can go ahead into that. Or, we'll Wallace, I guess, uh, we'll talk about the commercial item. And then, also, something else everyone will move on to the consent agenda. Tim, can I ask a quick question? Yes. You said so you want us to set up a work session for student. So when they do this, when they bring this, the graduates back. Is that, the, is that in the winter during break? They do it in January. I think it's, yes. yeah. It's, uh, it's I think they make it a best part of when the okay. yeah, I, I think it's okay. We just want to try to coordinate that. Uh, so. um, Wait, what is it? Yes, it's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It says, just wanting to reiterate that in order to ensure we're effectively preparing students for post-secondary success, it's wise to take a look at the success of our students in post-secondary world, math, preparing for homework, autonomy, goal setting, many postal and graduates struggle post-secondary. I think Tim mentioned this. So, yeah, I, yep. I, I do want to understand that. I think the important thing is also to, we have to move it beyond just College, yeah, you know, it's got to be trade schools, it's got to be all different aspects. Well, and you remember when the uh, was it, did Emily come forth and presented uh, some of her early work with the uh, math classroom in eighth grade? And really, the the a big to me, a, a big takeaway was just teaching kids how to be um, more resilient, self reliant, um, to seek and find the resources that they needed, you know, so advocate for themselves. These are the lessons that come out of that, not just math. And so, you know, lessons that will help them in the work in post-secondary regardless of track, so. Um, okay. Moving on to the consent agenda. Anything that needs to get pulled out? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Coons. Second. Second by Alaska. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We have an aye online as yeah, well. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Motion to <carry> unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> Action items. Uh, SIAC committee membership. Davis? Yeah, we, we try to we try to rotate uh, New members in, where do I have that at? When I had it up, oh, there it is. We, we try to rotate new members in. Um, uh, we've pared it down just a little bit, but uh, still with hitting all the, the necessary categories, uh, doing our best to keep it equal, male, female. 
Um, but again, this is a group that uh, we kind of use as a critical friend. Uh, we present things uh, to them. They give us feedback, um, data, strategic plan. Um, in winter, we bring in students, current middle school, high school students, get their feedback on how we're doing, basically. And so um, this is just a group that um, I, I, I recommend to the board for uh, representing our school community. Marina will note, as I just did my quick map on there, is that it does not comply with the state requirement of each of the balance. So Are we off? It's seven and ten. Okay. So we would follow the state change the change the state rather than encouraging you to but requires you to balance them plus or minus one. So we have not gone to be off, but we can't. So is there a max book or a minimum? Nope. So I think we'll have to look to add the okay. We'll have to add a couple of the to balance it out. So um so uh you can bring that you can bring that back next month to okay. add the recovery. I, I should have caught that. I just was just uh, came to my attention as I was glancing at it, but I didn't know that was right there. So, so, so you'll take with this? Uh, I think, well, I think we can prove it. You can prove who's on there. We can prove it. I mean, we can prove it. We can prove it. We can prove it. We can be adding more next month to balance the general self. I'll make a motion to approve the SIAC membership as presented with the. Uh, Motion by Alaska, second by Walt. Discussion. Um, Council or someone on mental health focus. Yeah, I mean, we can add them as part of the, the addition. So that, 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 makes mm -hmm. it, that makes it an easy, uh, yeah. easy way to do that. So, mm -hmm. so one of the, we'll one do. Of the additions yep. will be something on the mental health focus. And I, that's a, that's that was a, that's also sort of been our struggle. We, we, we tend to get more volunteers from both email and sort of SIAC, and so it's always been a struggle to get that. So it's, it is that it is that challenge in solving that. Like one of the one of the things that we have in the past and data suspension equals you know sometimes when you get a larger committee you know, you get names on there, but if they don't show up, right. then you don't. Have, it's hard to get it's more. It, you know, it's hard to get forms. But this one we have to have fifty percent of members show up in order to. Uh, in order for them to do business. So, um, okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, next up is fundraiser. Fundraiser. Uh, request. There's a lot of red on here, I noted. Um, things that are not being done this year. Is some stuff you added, correct? With so, permission. So they can add so they can they can add new fundraisers and they can make the process. This is yeah. So the challenge here, this whole document was set up to, to deal with things that are done every year. And so this is always my struggle is if we get when we get this thing that says not being done this year, is it really the annual fundraiser if you're not doing it? Mm -hmm. And that's that's always my that's always my struggle is this is really meant to be. A list of things that this is something we do every year, no matter what. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we just have to also look at some. I, I glanced at a couple of justifications, and you know, we'll have to be with we, we just, you know, we, some of them may be a little more detailed because they have to have some focus behind it. Like it can't be, it can't be too general. And so, um, saying raise money to support the club is kind of. <laughs> You know, something the auditor, if they ever looked at it, wouldn't be inclusive because then it's hard to, you know, what does that mean when you're, when you're doing fundraising? So, so I think the question we've got is do we strike the ones that are red? Um, and, have, and if they want to move in the future, they just have to apply it as they, as they would for any other fundraiser. Um, so, I think that's my, that's my question as I look at it. And the goal is, I mean, I think the red is, they're eliminating. No, the red is not doing this year. So that's the, that was the question I had. Is okay. Is the intent to eliminate or is it to? 
Do you think we're doing a better job with the board's goal as far as? Yeah, cards and cookie dough and candles and baskets and, and doing it more for youth camps and, and things that kids are getting something out of. So I think the only other thing is Jim was weird to ask about a calendar that kind of had that laid out so we went to fundraising was going on. Or was that was that Jim? Anyway, just if I could ask about that quite prior. It was a request about I'd have a have a visit of calendar form so you knew which which fundraisers were going on when. Uh, just, oh, well, he's, they've got him. They, they've got him. That's, that, but that, but yeah. not, you can't visualize. The, there's no way to visualize that. So, uh, in the future, I think it would be useful to put these annual ones to have a running count that just shows when things are going on. So, we know. Well, especially, I mean, there's a lot of people that do standardize just to make sure that those are not like one, one week and another one the next week. So, that's what it's like. Yeah. Uh, I should make a motion to approve uh, the 2022 2023 fundraising request as uh, listed. Second. Motion by Alaska, second by Coons. Any discussion? No, I mean, I would say I'd like some clarity about in the future. Color funding is nice, but it would be nice to have for sure. I, I still don't understand are the rent being stricken because they're no longer an annual fundraiser or. Well, one of them was I was just looking just at the other, and then it's crazy that we just go through them. So that was really and fbla is take they took over concessions right so, so yeah i just think from a clarity standpoint you know, I, know I, I just don't know what the stat we approve this i don't know i don't know what the red is we just know they're not doing it this year but i don't know so sure being stricken off of the annual request because of the, so. what would you want if they're not going to do it for the year? What, what would you just well, make this? If it's if it's not an annual fundraiser, it should be on the annual fundraiser. So it should be they should just submit you know, they do it every other year, every third year, they should just submit a request the year they don't do it, is what they, they should do. Um because this is really meant to streamline the process the things that are that they do every year uh and just plan around it. So um so I just like some follow-up. Clarification afterwards on that. On that so, <clears throat> motion to second. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next up is the November board meeting. Third Thursday in November. So instead of doing it falls the very nicely on the day of the Iowa Association of School Boards annual meeting. Uh, last year we, we postponed it and we did it and we had to rush back, I think is what we did. Yeah. Uh, in other years we've moved it. Uh, we will have to think more clearly about this when we do next year. The annual meeting is next year to plan this out in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the question is. And Chris, since it's a regularly scheduled meeting, um, we have to change it at a board meeting. So um, we want to change the time, we want to change the date. That's good. In coming back, at least for a long day. Mm -hmm. what, the calendar, yeah. calendar okay for Tuesday, athletic events, sporting events, band events, anything like that, we'll be okay. Is it one of those we could go earlier too? If there is stuff, I don't know if that works. 
Oh, we're going to have to send date and time right now. So okay. we, 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 we can make the decision in October. We don't have to make it tonight. We can table it. Um, but from a planning standpoint, it's, it's, it's nice though. At 4.15, Adam will be in Mount Vernon. There's a wrestling game. And there's a Walnut Honor Band concert at 7. So there's a Walnut Band yeah. Festival in Marion. The festival and concerts in Marion mm -hmm. at seven. Yes. Five thirty. Five thirty. So normal time. Motion. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. Is that a motion, Adam? Uh, make motion to uh, change the November board meeting uh, to Tuesday, November 15th at 530 p.m. Second. Motion by Alaska, second by Coons. I do have you registered for ISD, and I have rooms for all of you already. Perfect. And then I'll bring Hillary on Thursday, that Thursday, and then we're hoping there'll be a second person yeah. coming as well. Any other discussion on that? Hearing none, the motion is second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 There's another aye up there, so uh, all opposed. Motion carries unanimously. And then I was hoping you could do the delegate, yeah. delegate or Cassie. Cassie, maybe could say aye, Cassie. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can talk to, we, we, can, we can take a volunteer. So we'll talk to them offline and see who's available. Okay, perfect. The day before. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I just wanted to quickly, um, Casey started his, oh, sorry. Sorry, Josh. No, go ahead. <laughs> the engineer sitting to my right, it's got to be. <laughs> well, we're gonna move on. Um, so we we brought this up a few times. We uh, again just to quick review. Previously, last spring we met as a wellness committee. Um, went through the uh, a couple of meetings, a process, just to kind of whittle down what was truly important. As we're looking at the board policy itself, the board policy itself doesn't necessarily need to change the really at all because the goal areas are the same. It's nutrition, education, and promotion. It's physical activity. And then we st still maintain mental health and wellness as a, as a critical component or goal area, and then personal safety as a goal area, which are still listed in our board policy. What we're trying to do is better articulate the activities um, beyond just the board policy because the board policy is supposed to be broad, but to articulate the activities or areas that we're going to focus on over the course of this year, potentially next year, um, to keep our, our work moving forward. Obviously, our nutrition education program um, still, still maintains, but a couple of things that we're, we're doing this year um, or need to complete over the course of the next couple of years is really take a look at our health standards guaranteed by our full curriculum process 485. That's an area that's been kind of missed over the last several years. Um, we're going to utilize a nutrition specialist. So uh, Becky, the nutrition program uh, brought on a nutrition specialist uh, for the program uh, and essentially will be providing additional lessons um, to classrooms, specifically at the elementary level, about um, demonstrating and promoting uh, healthy eating habits. Um, I'm not sure why I have that problem, so ignore that. Uh, physical activity, uh, continue to increase the percentage of students participating in varied activities that promote an active lifestyle. Um, uh, annually, I always bring that list and have that conversation around the PE waiver. Um, so that kind of aligns with that. So who's going to align with that? Implement a campaign to promote 
an active lifestyle and improvement of wellness. Um, we haven't done anything with that yet. Um, that will be on the horizon. Provide PE courses that will offer throughout the year that accommodate students' academic schedules. So really preferred PE options. And there's some opportunity during zero block for kids to participate in some of those things. Um, exemptions for students who are, who are active all year round, which is a question mark, something we want to continue to explore. Um, what is the possibility of those kids who are active all year round and are in <coughs> busy schedules that um, is, there, is there an option to support that for students? The big one, obviously, is the mental health and wellness piece. Um, when I met with Jamie and Dan in the spring, just to kind of summarize um, the information of, of from, from the committee. Uh, number one was we really want to strengthen and improve our tier one implementation um, and really look at fully implementing the DESA. We, we adopted the DESA during the year of the pandemic and just been kind of touch and go over the last couple of years. We've tried, we've done some work with it, but not consistently across the district. Uh, I think we have a good plan this year of uh, that implementation. Um, we have some new components we're adding to it for high school students. There's some lessons, um, tier one lessons to support uh, instruction at the high school level. Um, use all those components of the DESA, differentiate between tier one, two, and three plans, and those systems based on DESA results. Uh, we want to train and retrain all of our staff using the DESA. We have a really good opportunity this year because the system has changed a little bit. And so we'll look at training and retraining all staff on the use of that information and, and how to uh, screen students. Um, create a leadership team or create leadership team structures to address social emotional behavior at all across the district. Um, the admin team and counseling team met jointly um, the end of August um, to start the conversation around the goals and priorities we want to establish for the district regarding SEBH. Our next meeting coming up is September 23rd. Um, we have some conversations we need to have around tier one, how we're going to build the capacity of all of our staff across the district. Again, we have that, we're awarded that $52,000 grant. And we'll be attending, um, we have teams from each building attending the Iowa West Conference. Uh, convention in Des Moines in October. Um, then creating building level SEBH leadership teams, which is half is starting to happen, and teams are starting to form that specifically focus on SEBH. Uh, and then another part of the district uh, team is really to take a look at the district and community mental wellness committee. Um, and reestablishing that, but really trying to identify what is the purpose of that committee. And it's not just to share information, but to really help be engaged with them uh, in regards to what are the community resources available to us, partnerships that we can create, um, and as well as looking at those partnerships uh, with outside agencies that we could potentially provide school based therapy for our students, starting those conversations. Uh, I think another thing to point out uh, within that, that piece is our partnership now with uh, Community Mobile Crisis, which is um, headquartered in Johnson County. It used to be, well, it's, it's still through foundations too, but a lot of the, the support that we got was from Link County, through foundation to Johnson County, this uh, Community Mobile Crisis. Um, it's kind of taking that role, kind of that JFAS role um, for, for our district and we've met with them already and have started uh, some conversations with them in building those and strengthening that partnership with them. Um, and then finally, the, the second goal in their personal safety, which continues to be on that, that board policy, uh, looking at implementing the suicide awareness curriculum for 612, um, as well as adopt a safe touch curriculum to foster learning for student personal safety and positive relationships. Especially at the, I think the elementary level, we're still with that campus. So um, we just actually purchased that curriculum through uh, second step. So, any questions? Mm -hmm.
Well, I think it's a comment we can give you. Really, when we were there, the counselors can't be tier one mental health because while they're trying to teach, they may have a crisis. So the tier one really is a district job, right? So we're through the desk and all the, this stuff, we're pushing out this stuff. So the counselors can come in with tier two and tier three, you know, and, and really that's what we need to know is that they were struggling and trying to do all of it. And so I think um, I think this is important and um, I think it will actually free them up to be available in some of these situations, um, which I think will be good. And, and, uh, I thought it was uh, well, very productive to me this last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, what is the DESO? We have a schedule for it. It'll be October, I think, beginning, middle of October. We're, there's some training we need to do with our staff because the system is new and it's, there's just different uh, different ways to access it. But it's, it's, the, the system is um, much better than it was, way easier to use, way easier to set up. Um, to, for that for the screen purposes. And there is a high school component where students can actually um, break themselves in. So that is really a thing that we can Any other questions? All right, so what are you doing? Um, can I say one thing about the physical activity? Yeah. So the like the people who are active in the room. I get that, but like our PE coaches are really good about like making sure they're like healthy and like we do a lot of yoga. And so like making sure we're like if you're like hurting, <laughs> so healthy, like try to do the deal so you're not pushing yourself away. So I think it'd be great to like still have that and not like let it be a okay, but because then you don't have time to go see someone if you have to go like for sure. So what I do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and that, yeah. I think that's what that becomes. Yeah. Is like, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I think that's part of that. Not that we don't want, yeah. we don't want to get rid of that by any means, but good kids have an option. So yeah. they say, net that. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it goes back to the distribution of the resources. It was a period of time where athletes were did not get to be in their hours. You know, if you're in your season sport, you're not. So, you know, I think you're. So you pop in and out of <laughs> as, as your season ended, but you could be really quirky when you were in the middle of the quarters. Um, the way that the net does constitute a class, right? In the day, they can no, no. to the Mets the credit for some of those. Yeah. Kind of getting that, that computer. I wonder, too, even the kind of other nutrition stuff, right? That was different on the FCS stuff, mm -hmm. but still like the component of yeah. nutrition stuff, yeah. Yeah. physical education. That, uh, Tim, Cassie. Yeah, Cassie's got a question. Yeah, yeah. It, Cassie's question is: Will the leadership team slash structure that is being formed recommend an update to the policy and float that by Adam and I? I don't. So I, if, if there's an update to the, if there's if, if there's an update to the policy, it would go from the policy committee to the or it would go from the wellness committee to the policy committee. Correct. But I think, and correct me, Josh, there are no recommendations to change the current policy. What Josh is presenting is what the wellness committee came up with as far as goals to address the policy. And I guess what I heard is that maybe what I, I misheard, but I, I heard that there was some idea of changing the structure of the committee, which I think would affect the policy. Uh, Membership and structure. I thought I thought you mentioned some of the issues going through there. Well, I think that's the that idea that it's just under the leadership <coughs> leadership team, not the wellness committee. Yeah, the wellness committee will still remain the wellness committee. It's the it's the district level SEBH district wide team leadership. Team, okay, which is principals and counselors currently. That structure may change as we get our feet. Grounded, and we may want to incorporate teachers in a district level. But currently, the structure is going to look like district level leadership around social emotional behavior. Buildings will have their teams, and then those teams will feed up into and provide information and back to the district level and look at the district level team as kind of oversight to help guide and direct 
um, resources, think about other goals, um, how we might incorporate our com you know, community resources and supporting what's happening for, for our buildings. Okay. And, and that Thank you. Sense. Yep. Uh, different implementation of policy 5.2. Yeah, I think what came out of that policy was uh, we're going to avoid Sundays, Wednesday evenings, if there is any break from what the policy is, which I think Sundays is two to five or two to six, any break outside that that uh, would have to be logged and rationale stated with it so that we could review it mid-year and at the end of the year, I believe. And so this is the a document, an ongoing document that Casey created. Um, so right, it, it's the start. So let's see, there we go. Group date event and reasoning. Um, it's not completed yet. So I caught him caught him today um, as he was heading out to set up for volleyball and that. But we'll get rationale. And right now we have some music stuff on there. Um, I just wanted to get that in front of you to where if it's. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I will say is the part of the discussion we had is that if things needed to move around, we should, we should not be pushing academic activities into limited times to accommodate other activities. Yeah. I think that's fundamentally it's wrong to take a graded a graded academic activity and say you need to do this during a prohibited time because we're not willing to move other things around. There's, that's my own personal yeah. yeah. Well that's why I want to put it out early because it's these are November dates. November's the early state so we can go and tell the fine arts department move it. And I guess we've talked about musical that's historic. That's that's a different thing. Oh, this is the first yeah, one's musical. Yeah. But vocal music is you know, those are those are things that uh, okay really are graded and yep. You know, you know, and I, we had that as part of the conversation. Depends on what grade levels it is. They're an hour. They're an hour. Well, the problem is you can't grade on Sunday. So that is the problem, right? If you move to Sunday, but it's voluntary and you can't create a voluntary activity. Right? So I guess that's my feedback. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there would be. Well, I guess the challenge is we have a very good schedule. When we build our schedule for the year, we should not be pushing academic activities off of off of the periods where they can be. There we should be. Yeah. And you know, it really comes down to scheduling priorities. We have to. Yeah. And building principles that are we have to work the schedule out so these things fit in the time periods they should. Sure. Um. Talking points. Jamie, I'll let you go first since you are the you have the. Six um, minutes. Yeah, I, two two things. Um, first, I'm pretty excited about the math, the fact that it's working that we're keeping our kids to things instead of just memorizing, which is exciting. Um, so, and then the other thing is just to um, highlight and validate what Hillary mentioned about SCS. If we're preparing our students for success after school, that's something that she has pointed out and mentioned that is hurting and not preparing our students for success later in life when they graduate because they're not learning basic skills from us. So just something to, it might not fit in the discussion where it was mentioned, it, but I think it's very valid. So it's something that we need to think about and discuss. Sorry. We're going um, clockwise. I'm a very I'm an engineer. We go clockwise. <laughs> I liked what like Melissa and Mrs. Meyer I think said mm -hmm. about the like reassuring the students and like what they're doing wrong because it's good. It's like really nice to know like what you can improve on when your teachers are telling you. It kind of tells you like they care about you and like how you're doing in class. And well, I know my life would be very well if we had a lot. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think for me, uh, the important, the most important thing about that today is the students. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, 
it is weird that we didn't have to talk about it, but it's easy to get down the path where you're you are student focused, but then all of a sudden you realize you are not. You hear what you guys have to say, and you guys have to do that. I think those are the uh, those are scary things for teachers, um, you know, for administrators that can let you know uh, make things like this. Um, but uh, from you know personal experiences, you know, granted, I might have a little bit more heat um, with both of them, but but they um, they don't abuse that. Um, that privilege, and I think it'll be exciting to see how that um, morphs into our instruction. Um, it's still mine, but I'll go back with uh, Kevin back and with Dr. Stillwell. Um, I'm just anxious to see where that goes. You know, I think uh, there's been some good discussion there. Again, the mission and vision. We'll see how that kind of ends up. And, Action point for us, so. Cassie, I'll let you type yours if you want. Ah, oh, there she's got it. Uh, Davis is going to read it. All right. Talking points from Cassie like to focus on learning, getting more calibration on uh, literacy, getting more one to one connections to teacher students, and getting to those uh, cross cutting skills like writing, crossing over to math, et cetera. Second by Alaska. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 